The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our second talk uh, will, will be given by uh, Wallasa Vitvatikin. And we'll also be coming uh, and talking about uh, mass production and utilization of self-curing cements in Thailand. Uh, Wallace is a, a senior researcher at Siam Research and Innovation in Thailand. She's uh, received a BS at Cornell and her uh, doctoral degree from uh, Princeton um, and is a member of uh, a whole range of ACI committees, and I won't try to list all of the ones uh, that she's, uh, she's involved in, but she has an active uh, research group and research interests in microstructure and durability, and pretty much if you're at an international meeting looking at internal curing, you are going to run into Team Siam, and they're going to be there uh, because they're, they're actually doing quite a bit of interesting work on this. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Walasa, and we'll try to get your presentation. Um, this, this is a completely different view from what we've been presenting this morning and what we'll be presenting for the rest of the day. So uh, it's really, it started as a jealousy by cement producers that internal curing can only be done by revenue producers and by specifications, uh, specification writers. So out of jealousy, we have to represent ourselves and have a piece of this pie. So um, hopefully you'll find this interesting. Uh, it's a little bit of a different perspective. It's, a, it's much more of a technology push. Um, than a marketing uh, strategy that we have in this project. Uh, but what we have developed here in this case is, uh, is an actual cement that actually um, uh, that will do the self-curing or the internal curing. So let me do, uh, okay, let's hope this works. Um, the outline is actually quite simple. Uh, because I like this presentation to stay simple and, and be simple. And, Hopefully you'll learn something from it, and hopefully you'll be able to use it. Uh, I'll give you a little back, a bit of a background as to where we come from and, uh, and what industries we're in. Uh, I'll go through a very quick set of laboratory experiments, but what I wanted to share with you is this whole idea of commercialization of this product, as well as the field experience that we have. Uh, it's a different world. We're in a third world country, so uh, it's going to be a little bit different. I'm from a company called SCG. You saw my uh, earlier you saw my colleague talking about um, the use of natural fibers uh, in cement for internal curing. Uh, that's still very much in the research st stage, but in terms of a commercialized product, um, we have definitely moved on uh, to use SAPs uh, in, terms, uh, in, in terms of commercial uh, availability. The company itself is interesting. We have uh, five business units, one of which is uh, the cement business unit. Um, we make about 25 million ton, metric tons of cement. Uh, so we're not a big producer, uh, definitely not, not at the level of a whole cement or a cement or anything like that. Uh, but we're, we're just a little guy uh, in a very small area. Um, not only do we have cement, but we also have paper products. Uh, and that's why we brought in the natural fibers. And that might make sense now that you see the whole, the company as a whole. We also have petrochemicals. And so this is why we're interested in SAPs. Okay. And so, uh, in addition to that, we have uh, a business unit called Building Materials that does uh, ceramics, uh, tiles, and stuff like that. And finally, we have distribution. It's a, it's a relatively large new uh, It kind of sets up the picture for you as to why we're interested in this and why the technologies kind of came together. So we have two different types of cement, uh, and, and we'll separate them into, into just two. And this first type, you'll see this little brand, it's an elephant brand that we use, and it's your ASTM C150. Okay, so nothing exciting about that. 
And this is being exported at certain points in time. It's actually imported into the U.S. While the economy isn't doing that great here, it is not imported into the U.S., but when it was booming, it was actually imported here also. We also have another material called mixed cement, which is actually used with masonry products. It's typically used for mortars, as mortars. So we won't talk about this, but we'll talk about the ACMC-150. That's the part of the market we're interested in. The other stuff we've been playing with, for obvious reasons that I'm standing up here, is super-absorbent polymers. So this is your contact lenses. This is your baby's diapers. This is various different SAPs that you've seen me use in different locations. And so obviously you'd say, huh? Why? Okay, so this is the interrelationship between the various different business units in our company. And so wherever there's a chance for us to make a difference, as long as it's within our conglomerate itself, we'd like to utilize that knowledge and possibly create a cross-function to create a new product. And so the idea is to create a marriage between super-absorbent polymers and an ACMC-150. Very simple. And the idea is to be able to create this self-carrying cement so that you don't have to worry about various different types of lightweight aggregate. Sorry, I know you guys treated me to dinner last night, and I'm not putting you down. But the idea is to give another option to the industry that doesn't have lightweight aggregate. In Thailand, we just don't have lightweight aggregates. It's extremely expensive. It's not something we can afford here. And so to be able to offer internal curing from a cement perspective allows us to create a different line of products out there. And so in terms of laboratory experiments, obviously we've done the usual. You've seen the shrinkage. You've seen the various different expansion data. So there's a concrete mixture that we just threw out there, not very interesting at all. And so what we have here is in the blue bar, these are the strengths, the compressive strengths, sorry, they're in megapascals, compressive strengths at 3, 7, and 28 days. The blue line is using a standard ASTM-C-150 ordinary carbon cement that's been cured in water. The red line is that we leave it out at ambient temperature and humidity. We're kind of curious in terms of what we have in the field. And the green line, we're actually using the self-curing cement, leaving it out as a companion sample out in ambient relative humidity and temperature. So what you see here is that when we use the self-curing cement, it looks like it can actually do the internal curing. You're actually not losing as much water and you can have sufficient strength gain throughout the 28 days. So that's the initial thing that caught our attention. So we said, okay, so that's interesting. Let's see if it will actually work. Well, does it affect anything else? You're actually growing a polymer in there. And how do you design that polymer to make it work so well? So what we thought was with these SAPs, one of the biggest issues is salt loss. Because these SAPs wouldn't seem to swell. It takes a little while to kind of buffer up with the water a little bit. Kind of like this lightweight aggregate takes 48 hours to shrink in the water. These SAPs will take up to two hours to swell to its maximum point. So what happens? Well, you'll get a faster salt loss. The salt loss isn't all that much faster. So within the first couple of hours, the salt loss is maybe about two inches faster. So we're not looking at a major salt loss issue with this material. And one of the biggest concerns for us is really does it affect setting time. In a tropical country where the temperatures, when you're pouring concrete, sometimes the surface temperature is about 50 degrees C. It's really comfortable out there, and this is 50 degrees Celsius, so it's about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. It gets real toasty out there. So our concern would be whether or not putting this stuff in there would actually affect setting time, and what we found out is it doesn't. Okay, so overall, in terms of concrete performance, does it affect the workability? So what we found is it doesn't. So the next step would be, let's see if we can commercialize this stuff. Okay, there's a lot more background research to this, but let's move quickly into the commercialization part. And so we, as researchers, went to talk this bright idea with our marketing guys, who has no clue what internal curing really is, and so they have this bright idea. 
If you actually want to do internal carry and you want to see the effectiveness of internal carry, why don't we sell it to this particular market? In this particular market, the idea is they're rice drying pads. And so you get acres and acres of concrete pavement where every morning they will spread rice onto the concrete pavement. And it will get hit by sun and just like wind, and it will drop. Basically, you're trying to air dry the rice to remove the husk from the – to remove the rice from the husk itself. So wonderful condition. This is when you're drying rice. You've got high temperatures and light wind all the time. What a great location to be pouring concrete and not curing. So they said, let's just throw it into this particular market, and that's what we did. They said, that's perfectly fine. You didn't really see the construction practices before we got there. However, it is being sold in there, so it works. So cement in this particular market is not sold by ready-mix producers. What we discovered was when we got there, it wasn't sold to ready-mix producers. However, it is sold as big bags. These are one-ton bags, one metric ton bags of cement. And how it's used is even more interesting, and if there's a ready-mix producer in here, you can have a good laugh over this. So the bag itself – actually, this is not coming up in the right sequence. Let me do this. So the truck, the ready-mix truck, is used as your mixer. It goes up to this pond, and we suck water, naturally occurring groundwater, out of the ground and put it in this mix – put it in the truck. They come in, and then you load the cement, and basically you strip the bottom of these big bags straight directly into this five-cubic-meter truck. And then you've got the backhoe kind of just pouring the aggregates and the coarse and fine aggregate in it. You would never think that this is anything here scientific, right? Okay, so we were shocked to see this whole process, but we said, okay, we're confident in our cement. We don't think it's really going to – it's really going to affect anything. We were surprised at the outcome. And so this is very unconventional. You'd never think this works. And the travel distance between usually these aggregate piles and where they're pouring is about 100 meters. You've got less than a minute of mixing. It's really incredible that it works. And so, okay, the process itself is the truck comes in, dumps the cement. This is a particularly good picture because everyone was wearing shoes. Typically, you don't. Again, this is in Thailand. And so you see that these guys are actually bringing the steel mesh in, so the concrete is poured. It's not really compacted. It's just kind of scraped in there. The steel mesh is brought in, and then these guys will step on the steel mesh to make sure it settles in at the right distance, and the surface is finished. And to finish the surface, and this is the fun part, they actually will dump – will actually put up like a spread, just basically cement onto the surface, just to harden the surface a little bit, and we'll run a little bit of a machine over it just to get that hard, hard smooth surface on these slabs. Okay, this is a particularly large market. In Thailand, we can make a lot of rice, and so we have to dry a lot of rice here. And so, okay, so now you're thinking very good cement in a very substandard concrete production capability. And so we were surprised at what the field results were like. Okay, so typical site layouts, usually the slabs are about 5 meters in width and in typically 10 to 15 meters in length. Okay, so no joints in between. We'll just pour these strips of concrete. So we were – first of all, okay, so this is completely uncontrolled. We've got the backhoe putting in the various different aggregates. You would never think that the slump was actually reproducible. So using the two different types of cement, we actually took our research team out there. We took our conditions out there, and we were surprised that in actually measuring the slump of the concrete on location coming out of that truck, out of that truck, both using the Type 1 OPC as well as using the self-curing cement, we got 18 centimeters, about the same, which was surprising. So considering that we had no control, we kept on doing this measurement for a little while, and we definitely saw consistency in the products that we got. But what was interesting is the issue of segregation. Once you actually put these SAPs in there, it manages water a lot better than if you weren't to – if you weren't to put any SAPs in there at all. And so the issue of segregation really comes up when you're using a Type 1 OPC. Okay, so because you don't mix it very well, you're actually using a concrete truck to mix it, which is not your ideal mixer at all. You're mixing it for less than a minute. 
Okay? So everything says you shouldn't be able to mix it very well. And so typically, as you would get, you would get sanitation of the concrete that comes out. This is not the case for the self-carrying cement. Um, typically, when you walk around, you can actually see that um, the segregation is very limited. And uh, in this picture, you can see clear segregation of the concrete when you're using a typical type 1 OPC as compared to the, the self-carrying cement that we put out there. And this issue really comes up uh, because of the SAP's ability to control water. Okay, so it's, it's, it's withdrawing water from the concrete at their appropriate times and at their appropriate rates. Um, and so we went back up uh, to the on location and we did weekly checkups on the surface. Uh, by the way, they don't cure this thing. They, they typically don't. They pour the concrete and leave it. Um, and a few days later, whenever there's enough rice to actually dry on the surface, they'll just start using it. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, but what's important is they don't really run the trucks over it. Uh, that's kind of the nice part. So uh, we were finding surface cracks uh, on the concrete with the type 1 OPC. This is a, your typical shrinkage cracking. Uh, where there are short cracks that are about uh, four to five inches long. Um, we were walking around on the surface that was, uh, that was used, that uh, we poured this, the concrete with the self carrying cement in there. there. At that point in time, up to 28 days, we weren't finding any surface cracks on it. Um, and so we're not sure if that's a lucky thing. We've tried this on about seven or eight different sites, and now it's a commercial product, so they've uh, actually done it on hundreds of sites now, um, and we haven't gotten a complaint. Uh, in terms of the surface follow-up, it's very interesting. Once you use these SAPs, again, they're controlling the water very well. And so you get a very nice surface. Okay, so you don't have those spotty surfaces. Just because these SAPs will actually not only control water, but actually distribute water within the concrete very effectively. Uh, and so uh, you get rid of this, this issue of, of the surface, of the, the surface color being inconsistent uh, on, um, on, the concrete, on the concrete itself. Uh, what we found, uh, this is a surprising find for us. Uh, typically when uh, the rice is poured onto uh, the pavement, at the end of the day they use a backhoe to pick it all up and then put it back into the side. Um, and so that backhoe will actually spray the surface, uh, pick up the rice, and go back and dump it uh, in, in the storage space for the night. And so you see this typically when you go out to all these pavements, you see this straightening on the surface. Basically, it's, it's, the, it's the back row going in there and straight from the surface. It's always in the same direction. What we were finding is that the surface of the, uh, of the concrete that was using the self carrying cement was actually harder. Okay. Uh, is it a measurable, harder uh, surface? At that point in time, we went out with a shrimp hammer and other forms of uh, hardness measurements. They weren't all that different. Um, however, we think we left it too late because uh, what if had you measured it within the first couple of days, you probably would have picked up the differences in the hardness. We're not completely sure if it's a water control issue or it's simply uh, because uh, um, the material is actually uh, the the final uh, the final microstructure is actually different. So this is what's most impressive or most striking to us uh, is actually the strength of the concrete itself. So we actually took uh, cube, again this is cube strength. Sorry about that. We didn't have cylinders, and uh, we don't really use cylinders. So we collected again uh, two types, uh, two samples from OPC, two sets of samples from OPC. One that we use to cure in water, and the other that we'll let, leave it out in the ambient uh, and then pick it up on the day that it's being tested. Uh, and so the other one, uh, it's that of the self-curing cement, and you can see that the strength is comparable to uh, to cement uh, to concrete that uses uh, type one OPC that's been cured in water. So these, these are these are actually field data. Question is why? Okay. And I've got two minutes to go through this, so I'll go through this relatively fast. Uh, we have uh, a polyacrylamide, um, and it's an ionic polymer uh, that has uh, that leads to uh, when it takes in um, cations, it'll lead to electrostatic uh, repulsion. Okay. So if you go into the chemistry of it, it's actually a lot of fun. So what happens? These uh, polyacrylamides, if you throw them in water, they'll swell, swell them about 15 times. Okay, if you throw them in either a cement filter, which is that, that water that comes out of your cement, or a sodium hydroxide solution, it'll, it'll swell up to about 20, 20 times. Okay, so the swelling is quite different. So it actually likes a certain, um, certain amount of cations in it. But what's really interesting is this particular slide and the one following it. So we throw it in calcium hydroxide first. Uh, the first one, uh, look only at the first line. Uh, look only at the first line for now. Okay, so we have this uh, SAP, solution polymerized SAP, 
If you throw it in the calcium hydroxide, it swells in an hour, it swells 20 times. At 24 hours, it swells nearly 30 times. And what we do is we take that out of the calcium hydroxide solution and throw it into the sodium hydroxide solution, and it continues to swell. Okay. That was surprising to us. We didn't think it would continue to swell. Now, it doubled the swell. Okay. So what happens if you do it in reverse? And Jason's about to tell me that I'm out of time completely. So you do the reverse. You throw it in the sodium hydroxide solution. It's a slower swelling process, but it swells a lot more, 54 times, right? So what happens when you actually take that sample and then throw it back into the calcium hydroxide solution? In a saturated condition, you can actually make the SAPs de-swell. Okay. Very interesting. You can make them give away water, even in a fully saturated condition, as the cations, as the ionic component of the solution is changing. And so what I wanted to leave you with, oh, there's another question. Is this. What I wanted to leave you with here is that um, it can be, uh, there's another solution to internal curing, and we can integrate it directly into the cement itself, uh, with no negative impact on the fresh properties. Actually, there's positive impact on the fresh properties um, if it's not, uh, if, it's, if the concrete isn't done correctly, there's, there's a little bit more wiggle room with this material. Um, and uh, what, we, what we get out of it is that we observe, um, we observe benefits even, even at higher waters of cement ratio. So even when you think internal curing really doesn't help, it'll actually, by using SAPs, you can actually see the effects of, of the presence of SAPs in the concrete itself. And what we did observe was that the early strength gain is faster once you put the SAPs in there. And we have an idea why. And uh, if any of you are going to the prod meeting next week, uh, you'll actually hear actually the details of, as to why this early strength gain is happening. So, <coughs> Let me close with that idea and with that teaser. I can explain it a little bit more, but I'm completely out of time. I ran out of time. Sorry. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Questions? So don't go. I think there's three people who just went out and made a phone call to start selling lightweight aggregates for rice. Corn <laughs> uh, <laughs> slabs. Uh, Okay. Are your SAPs going to be available, or are you going to be available for some time? This whole idea is not on the pilot. Um, in terms of SAPs, SAPs are available, polyfilms are available anywhere. This is, this is, this is, this is anything from, from your contact lenses to your diapers. And we're not using anything. We're not using our own SAPs for commercial production. We're actually getting a commercially available SAP and using it in that soon. Um, and so, in terms of what's available, uh, it, it can certainly be available. There's got to be some other cement producer in here. We don't produce cement and we don't sell it into, into the U.S. and Canadian market. Um, it's available where we are in. It's just, unfortunately, not available in the U.S. Quite. Thank you very much. Other questions? Go ahead. So the, the SAP, is it... Interground or is it? No, no, it can't be interground. Yeah, yeah, it can't be interground. Um, the temperature of grinding right now is 80, 90, 100, some grinding at 150, which is ungodly. Um, it can't be interground at those temperatures. They're polymers. They really don't like high temperatures very much, and they get kind of sticky. Uh, and so, most of the cost that that is used, most of the increase in cost in producing these, the self curing cement is actually taking it through another process. You do the separate grind process, so it goes through another mixing um, to create this particular cement. So the cost of SAPs isn't expensive at all. It's, it's the issue of having to mix it again and create that, creating that homogeneity in the cement um, before we send it out. So uh, so it, it can't be integrated. We, have, we haven't found a way. The temperatures are just too Other questions? Hello? Oh, hi. Well, congratulations. It was a very nice presentation. And just uh, maybe a comment regarding on warehousing, if this type of combined cement with, you know, the SAP, um, like, we understand we have to take care of the Nutura of warehousing because of the humidity uh, issues. So what would you comment on? Okay, so uh, typically, uh, in this, this particular market, it's not ideal. Uh, so what I've shown you is this particular market doesn't, it's really not your typical market anyway. Typically, when we use it in ready mix, um, in ready mix operations, it goes into it goes into a silo. Actually, it stays in the silo in 
bar cement plant also until the day on the discharge and the bags are taken. The timing to use these big bags, it really stays in the big bags maybe no more than 36 to 48 hours. So it's actually a very short time period that it stays in the big bags. I mean, you would take care of it, you would have to take care of the cement the same way you would take care of a standard ASTM cement. It's good if it's not there. Once again, thank you very much for a very interesting talk.